we do have a special guest here, Lucy from UK government. And in, in the panel, I'm going to give you the first, first uh, question and first answer. How do you see, coming from UK government, how do you see the whole transport market? How will it evolve and how will the, the cities and, the, and their transport evolve in the, in the coming years? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we've already heard from some, from some of the panelists here. Um, I think we can expect to see um, a significant uh, continuation of the shift towards the, the sharing economy. So uh, this kind of idea that instead of purchasing uh, private vehicles and, and, and owning assets for your mobility, uh, instead you purchase that as a service. So this idea of uh, carpools, car clubs, um, perhaps also kind of bike pools, things like Uber. So I think uh, we will see a strong continuation of that, particularly in, in city regions. Um, I think we will begin to see uh, a lot of new entrants to the market. Um, so I think those, those will be companies um, looking to develop services, looking to compete on customer experience. Um, as we've seen in, in, in other sectors, um, really looking to build that kind of customer loyalty. Um, and I think we will also see um, some of those new entrants, uh, and this is just my personal view, um, looking to uh, create services that really blend uh, existing public transport uh, along with private provision. How do you see, in your view, how do you see the government's or the city's role? Does it have to change or will they just do the same old, same old? Um, I, I, I think the cities uh, will need to start engaging more with some of the sorts of companies um, that we've seen today. Um, I think there's a, there's a really big opportunity to provide um, more choice for customers, more choice for people traveling. Uh, and I think they can only do that by truly understanding how best to integrate all of the different services that we're starting to see develop. Yeah. Okay, so to all of you, um, I think we all agree that the, the whole market of transport is on the verge of big disruption or already is actually ongoing. Uh, but then the issue is, what do you think is, is the big thing? What, what is the big driver or what is, what is the thing that, 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 is, that is being replaced or what is the disruption actually? Maybe starting from you. For me, I think the disruption is technology itself. Um, so all of the things that we've talked about today, none of them would have been possible without the mobile technology. And that suddenly brought us, just in the last few years, um, the ability to um, share traffic information, to understand real-time data about where the train is or, or where your Uber is. Uh, and so for me, the biggest driver will be further technology e evolution over the coming years. Carlos? For me... Uh for me, I think it's going to be more around legislation and seeing how government authorities and cities are, how fast can they adopt new technologies, how fast can they adopt new legislation to allow new players to start making an impact. Obviously, technology will need to show that we can save lives, we can improve the you know, satisfaction of citizens, but I think as many other industries in transportation will see technology players moving faster and governments and cities trying to be, you know, some of them are going to be very innovative, are going to adapt very well. Some of them will, will lag behind. So I think that will be the, the key driver to faster implementation. I think, I think the, the, the future is also something that Joe was mentioning about multimodal transportation. It's also how we understand user behaviors, user patterns, so that we can serve our users better and uh, how we can also work with public transportation authorities so that we can also understand if person uh, X wants to get to A to B and want to do it in the quickest or shortest way, what are the different types of model transportation that they can use? Or if someone says, I don't mind waiting, but I want to take public transportation, or so how do we do it so that people have access in one single platform, all different type of aggregators, all type of services that they could have in the city? I think that's where we could also serve better our users. That's also feedback that we get as well through our surveys that people to say, wow, great, we have Uber, we have Waze, but we have Move It. But how much different are you guys? So I think we have to do a lot of work on that. And that's going to be the future as well for transportation in general. Um, I, think, uh, I think we're starting uh, to collect a really rich uh, ecosystem of data around the transport network. Um, so I think we have that both on the public transport side, um, particularly from things like advances in, in ticketing types. So we're able to 
collect information about how people are traveling around networks, um, but then also from services like Move It and, and, and Uber and Waze, um, so the journeys that people are making and the journeys that they would like to make. Um, so I think we will start to see um, some of that data start to come together and, and provide us with some really rich information um, to help us uh, manage, I suppose, the, uh, the supply of transport and match that better to the demand side. I think, uh, I think it's user behavior, how, how users are understanding that they actually can ask for the service level, a better service level in transportation, but it's linked, of course, to the service selection that, that, that they have, that they have alternatives to the current ways that they move. There has to be both. Well, that's changing transportation a lot. You all made a point, uh, I'm on. You all made a point of, of, of the ownership of car. Almost everyone, and I, and, and I started with saying that it's a roughly about 10,000 billion euro annual market. Um, out of that, roughly about 80% is, is ownership and usage of a car. So, believably, there's, 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 that's where the money lies. At the same time, we see lots of, lots of these aggregators coming in, um, or at least hoping to be coming in. You all provide an app, uh, and then Sonia was telling about mobility as a service. Do you think that there will be some sort of aggregation? And what are the bottlenecks of, of not having that? That's, um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the big elephant in the room, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I think I, I would say that we, we're all in this together. Like My theory, number one, public transportation is always going to stay. We need public transportation. It's, and as I was saying before, it all depends on the use, user case. So if someone wants to get quickest, they may take Uber. If they, if they want to drive, they have their own car, they can use Waze. Or people like me that are completely useless, I don't have any driver's license from any of the countries that I lived in, I'm always going to be dependent on anyone who's going to take me to work, public transportation, or any type of, uh, of, of, of modality. Just as, just as the data, uh, millennials in Germany, for instance, the percentage of millennials in Germany like 10 years ago who wanted, well, what was millennials 10 years ago in Germany who wanted to have a driver's license was 75%. Right now, it's, it's reduced in 10 years in 65%. So there's going to be even more people who are not going to be relying more on cars, but they want to be more eco-friendly and people they want to be sharing. And that's also where the concept of sharing economy comes into place as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give it to Joe. Supposedly, that was the big Big elephant, why, why on earth? <laughs> Do you feel like that? I think there'll be intense competition. Is this on? No, no. I think there's going to be intense competition at all stages of the, of the value chain, essentially, from the first interface with the, with the user all the way through to the, the transportation provider themselves. But I actually think that's part of what will stimulate innovation in, in the sector. So it, it's almost good. And, and having that competition to who's is, whose app is the easiest to use? Is it easier just to get out my Uber app and call Uber directly? Or is it easier to use Move It or Google Maps or something like that and then go into the provider from there? And so we'll see a lot of competition and a lot of change. But yeah, we'll have to see how it evolves. I, I, actually, I actually think that um, when we say cars or buses, I feel like we're looking very short term, like in the future. And the future is not like 50 years from now, it's maybe like 10 or even less. We're not talking about cars, we're talking about things that move people or things that move packages, but those things could be self, like autonomous cars that are totally different from today's cars. Those could be drones, those could, those could be flying things. So I don't think it's like, it's more about who is gonna provide those platforms. And I, on that sense, I think like, the role of administration will evolve less about providing the means of transportation and more about regulating the different players in the traffic space. So like private initiatives might provide shared assets. So we'll move from, I have my own car, otherwise I go to a bus or the subway, to I have many cars or I, ha I just have mobility as a service. Like I can own a car for 10 minutes anytime I need it, or I can own a bus for any time I need it, whenever I need it. So we'll move, but I think like that will be driven by the private sector because as we are seeing with many companies, there's a huge industry about to be disrupted and there's great money behind that. So the role of the administration would be more about 
organizing what kind of vehicles are moving out there, when, how, uh, and people will care about subscribing to the services that will move them or move things, but not necessarily about I own this or I need to get my government to provide me with a bus to get from A to B. All right, let's pick up on that one. You, you said that the future and the automation will actually, when, when the actual self-driving cars are here, they will really change everything. Um, and they are quite fast, I've, I've seen them myself. Uh, so, um, 2030, how do you think a smart city will look like? Will we have parking space? Will we have public transport? What will we have? Will we have roads at all? Lucy, maybe you start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, I don't know whether we will, we will have fully autonomous vehicles by 2030. Um, I certainly think there's a, a very interesting opportunity provided by them. Um, so, I think there are some statistics out there at the moment that show that currently the, the kind of average privately owned vehicle um, spends about 96% of its time just parked um, so only 4% of that time is actually productive time um, driving to and from somewhere. Um, so I think, I guess the, the opportunity that autonomous vehicles open up is that they can flip that around and spend most of their time actually uh, on, on the road. Um, and I guess you could also uh, envisage a scenario in which all of their time is spent on the road. So it's either traveling to somewhere or from somewhere, picking people up and dropping them off. Um, so. Um, Will we still have parking? I think, I think probably. Um, hopefully, we will be utilizing our, our, our transport assets in, in, a, in a more efficient way, though. I, I, yeah. So I actually think this is all going to change. The moment some small city, small village, some lab area can prove that self-driving cars can save lives completely, or 99.99%. That moment, everything's going to change because right now, I don't know this stat, but it's like tens of millions of people dead and injured every year because of traffic accidents. So that's the number one priority to solve. I like the second we start seeing enough sample data to prove that self driving cars can save lives completely or almost at a very, very high percentage, I think that's when society is going to really move towards we need to implement that everywhere because. At the end of the day, transportation, it's a mean to move people, but we need to keep the people alive, right? So any transportation that doesn't guarantee safety is not efficient. So I think, you know, we will see how fast we can implement a few projects um, that can show it's, it's doable. But I think like one quote that I really like from Larry Page, he was saying that at some point in the next few years, it will be, it will be unethical to drive a car as yourself, as a human. You know, it'll be so dangerous that it will be not ethical to drive your own car. So I think like, that's where we're going, and it's, I think it's uh, 10, 15 years from now. Um, I, I think we also need to be realistic about how cities are designed. And this is when we s start talking about urban planning. Uh, the city of Barcelona, the city center of Barcelona is not going to change just because you're going to implement driverless cars. Or well, the city of London, the downtown area, or, or, or historic center is not going to change because of that. It's mo for me, it's more of a question of how do we make more efficient the prime space that we have in the city so that we can transport people better? And also how we serve the needs of those users that they're going to live in different areas? Or, and, and the big question as well that we've been discussing in the past days, what happens with rural areas? What happens in, pl in places where maybe public transportation cannot get there or maybe private transportation cannot get there? So it's, it, it, you need to be careful about that as well. I do believe that and it's something that's going to happen, but you need to think that a vehicle is in a space, a space that is going to be the city and how the city is designed. And there are going to be some limits on where, how this vehicle is going to circulate. So it's more about, for me, how that's going to fit into the overall system and how we can all help to, with transfer authorities to say, this is how our users are using our, 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 our private uh, transportation, and this is the data, and openly build better cities all together. I think that's where the, we can be game changers in a sort of way, and that's the reason why I think it's such a great panel to, and to be here with all these, uh, all you guys. In the beginning, I promised that there's a chance. I know we have a lineup which I'm kind of proud of. I think that these are one of the, the most interesting persons on earth to talk about transportation. Uh, I know we have a runner somewhere, so if there's one or two questions from the audience at this point, might be a good 
good place to do it. Do I see any raise of hands? While I'm looking here, you might all um, answer a question. I know that there are lots of startups or, or people that want to be startups, and you come from really interesting and valued companies, and, and UK, which is one of the trendsetters here, and Sonia, you've been everywhere in the world now. Uh, what are your tips? Let's say that we have the entrepreneurs here who want to be billionaires. Where would they have to go? Where, do you, where would you point them out? Good tips? Um, I, 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 number one, I mean, I'm, I used to work for a big company, uh, Google. Now I work for a startup, big change. Number one, be bold, be creative, be innovative, and question the system. Be disruptive. Do not ask for forgiveness, but later on, but try to innovate. Uh, as a conservative European myself, I've had to redo my brain when I moved to Silicon Valley and rethink that you may have to ask for forgiveness because maybe your idea was so bloody good that it's going to succeed. So don't, don't be afraid of taking risks. That's, that's right. Yeah. I think uh, rules and regulations can be changed. So you just need to think what people actually want and then make that kind of a service. What I would, um, okay. oh, what I would say is if you want to work, if you're developer, startup, like entrepreneur in the transportation space, my recommendation is like don't think about today's world, like this is over. It's just like a few more years that we have of today's world, but start thinking of what's coming next. Start thinking of, again, self-driving cars, how urban planning is going to change, what new vehicles we're going to have out there, because really we have already developed some really cool solutions to solve today's or the past uh, of transportation. But whatever's coming next, it's really, really exciting. And I think you all guys have an amazing chance to innovate in that space. So forget about today and start thinking about tomorrow. Joe. Oh, Sonia. Sure. Um, so I, I, my advice would be to think big um, and also to focus on your customer experience. Um, I think that's a really great area to gain a competitive advantage. And at Uber, I mean, I've been lucky enough that my experience is much more in scaling up an existing business rather than those, those early days. But what's been um, incredibly useful for us is just to have that very clear mission. So for the whole company, we're striving for transportation as reliable as running water. And how we provide that will obviously change as, as technology evolves, but making sure that the whole team is, is aligned behind that vision. All right. If anyone wants to run in, I don't see you very well, so just come, come in front if you have a, if you have a question. Uh, we touched that just now. Let's take a bit more boring, but something that we have to do. Regulation. I think in, in transport space, you know, there are companies coming from one direction, another direction, mm -hmm. everywhere. Okay, while we get that, what is wrong and what should be done with regulation, in your opinion? Hello? And then we'll take... Oh, let them answer this and then we'll take it, okay? Anyone want to do regulation? Uh, Why is it such a topic? I, I, don't, I don't think uh, we live in societies. Societies need to have an order. Order is good. I believe in common good. Um, if you ask back in California, we would say, seriously, um, I believe in freedom. And it's not even freedom, it's liberty. If you come to Europe, I would say, my European conservative side, I would say, no, a father state needs to help me regulate on what I need to do. I think there's always a middle term. Uh, the state has its own rule to preserve the, the common good and what needs to be given to all citizens. And uh, we cannot see the state as something negative. I think it's the opposite. I think we, and as I always say, we're all in this together and that the end user is the one who's going to benefit from all the great things that we're going to be doing together. Okay. Yep, go on. So. Well, for, from my point of view, from my point of view, I think what people like Lucy or Sonia or many others are doing today is the, is the right thing to do is like start talking, start interacting, start collaborating, start testing. I like across the world you can see huge amount of uh, cities, government officials that care about this and are getting very close in conversations, conferences to uh, all different players. 
So I think that's that's a step number one. They're doing it, and I think that's the right way to go. It's like, let's drive the conversation all together, because all together, if we listen to each other, we will find a better solution. All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the time. So um, since no one wanted to ask any other questions, I was thinking of asking sort of a future, too futuristic, uh, fun topic. What do you guys think will happen where, when artificial intelligence will get beyond our limits and might t uh, t start taking over our cars? Like, for example, in uh, iRobot. And if he, that's even a reality. Uh, do you mind repeating? I didn't just... Yeah. Get in the mic a bit. Is it better now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So my question was, what happens if artificial intelligence uh, gets beyond our capability of control and will start taking over our cars as well? Like happened in iRobot, for example. Uh, I personally not watched the movie, no. just openly, <laughs> but I can already imagine all the catastro catastrophistic of whatever visions about the end of the world or whatever. But... I think that um, the technology is at the service of the human. If it's the opposite, Houston, we have a situation. Uh, innovation is good, but as I said, it's under a certain order, and it's, un it's under certain ethics and un certain norms that need to serve everyone. If that's the opposite, we have a situation. We, we could also talk about all the things of moral dilemmas and everything, but uh, uh, that's, that's my point. Uh, one more question, just to clarify. I think um, I wanted to ask, even if it's a reality that this could happen, um, yeah. What? If it's a reality or? Yeah, I think like as soon as we have self-driving cars, everything will be managed automatically in the sense that we don't need human input to navigate the car or to you know, set the speed of the car or how the car is, now, you know, where the car is going, like all of that will be automated in a way, you know, the same way factories, many factories today, a lot of the work that used to be done by uh, human employees now is automatically done by machines, is programmed, so I don't, I don't see any problem with that. It's just gonna make our life easier, will allow us to spend time on whatever we want, will leave us with less frustration out of being stuck in traffic, no accidents, so to me it's a super exciting world and I'm, I'm really looking forward to have machines driving me everywhere and flying me everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, technology is always good itself. It depends on the type of use that you make out of it. And uh, I think that's also where I do believe in that, that the state can also help to put some order at times when situations can get out of control. And that's, I think that doesn't, some people take it on the negative and they say, oh, we're cutting innovation. I don't think so. Well, there's something new. There's also needs to be agreement as well. Uh, I do believe in disruption, but you also need to agree on what's going to be the impact and how that's going to benefit all the users. Hi, all right. my name is Larry. And uh, yeah, I just want to ask you, do you think Apple will join Tesla and Google with the artificial intelligence, uh, well, that, you know, self-driving cars? And uh, what about the old car manufacturers like Toyota and so on? Do you think they will join or, you know, Tesla and the others? Or do you think um, they will lag behind and die? <laughs> I, I, I think winter, you, is, coming. Working for winter is coming for the uh, auto industry. I would just put it like that. <laughs> they, should, they should observe. They should look out, start collaborating with the different technology. I like in the end, I read an article really good the other day on hardware as a service, not even mobility, but Tesla being the first hardware as a service model where it's not about manufacturing the car, it's about the software and the service. The car is just gonna be whatever, even not a car. Whatever is moving you from place to place, it's just gonna be a commodity. So I think we will, we will move to that kind of world. So manufacturing cars will not be that exciting as building the software or building the service that will get you there. You know, on that side, Uber is, is moving in that direction too. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, so to your point on kind of traditional car manufacturers, vehicle manufacturers, um, I think we are already starting to see some of the, the very large vehicle manufacturers think about how some of these trends might change their business models. 
Um, so I think uh, there are already some of those starting to think about, actually, um, are we going to move from a model where we're primarily um, selling a product to, to, to consumers um, to actually just leasing a fleet of vehicles? Um, and I think there are a lot of them are already starting to think about that space. Let's take this a bit further. Am I, am I on? <laughs> Let's take this a bit further. It's not just the automotive industry that's, that's struggling. All of you companies that are really interesting and are booming uh, have no physical transport. At the same time, we all know that we kind of need somehow physical transportation until someone will beam us up, but that's not, that's not well, at least in a few years. Uh, is there any interest in being in the physical transportation part? Not just the automotive, the public transport, the taxis, all of that, or will they struggle? And, and how will that evolve? Because I don't see uh, any great value, investor value, no, none of those. Tesla is the only one that actually produces a physical mode of transport or a physical car that's so actually been in, in investors' minds. None of the others, really. Uh, it, will, it will evolve, yeah. right? It will evolve what is that you are manufacturing will evolve. For now, we can't fly as humans or we can run at 200 kilometers per hour. So we need something to move us faster what that is, that will evolve. So I think for sure there's a big future in hardware. But again, it's not about what you are building, it's how that plugs into the whole service that you provide. So yeah, I think like every hardware like manufacturing company will have a saying in what is that is gonna move us, but they will need to evolve and not get stuck with car has to be the way to move people, because that could be anything else. Uh, I think it's also going in a different direction. Um, we're, I mean, I, I have to say it so that there's no conflict of interest, but I, we're funded by BMW. Uh, so one of the things that BMW is also doing is investing in electric cars, car sharing solutions. But the way that it works is that they've done the pre-work of understanding what the user wants. So they know that there's more concern in the whole world, and this is something that is just not only for the user, but all nations in the world, they want to reduce uh, carbon and, uh, emissions. So you want to have electric cars, for instance. Or if you want to say that you want to work on the sharing economy, you, you have car sharing as well. I think it's, uh, it's the automotive industry is, uh, is, is, is at its own pace, but we also need to understand that it's a very complex ecosystem. There's a lot of players involved, but I'm happy to hear that companies like BMW, like Mercedes, Daimler Benz, they're already betting on eco-friendly solutions, car sharing solutions, and that they're also working with the public transportation authorities and also with private sector to be able to launch, I mean, those car sharing solutions. That's, that's exciting to see that there is a response. I would have never thought that that would have happened like uh, probably 10, 15 years ago. I mean, so th it's a change. We need to give everyone a chance. That is true. We have another. Uh, hello. I'm staying here for quite long listening to that. Sorry. Ah, well, <laughs> thank you for your time anyways. There is one question concerning open source in like using, like using, using open source in this kind of model because we're thinking about changing a future. And, um, and what I believe that uh, this change will happen in the nearest future. And my project is all, uh, also about that. So I'm thinking that should I make it open source so it will be faster moving forward? Or what do you think about using open source in these cases? I'm a firm believer of open data, open source. That's the platform that we use, OSM, for MoveIt. Uh, open data is the bread and butter for me. That's how I can launch cities when that's the first data point that I go when I want to launch in a city. If not, I use also crowdsourcing, like similar to what Waze does with the community of editors. So I am a firm believer. We can also talk offline on your specific product as well, because I'm not familiar with it. But uh, I'm, I'm personally a firm believer. And this is also a great opportunity for transit authorities as well and local players to really be at the hedge of innovation and helping companies to evolve. And developers like you have access to the information so that you can create extremely great products, like probably the one that you created. OK, um, we're running out of time. So I'll get each one of you to have one sentence. I, I, 
I think that we all agree that it's a huge system. No, everybody agrees that no one can do this alone. Not governments, not Ubers, not public transport, not the uh, car manufacturers. No one can do this just alone and provide good enough for the, for the end user. What do you see as the toughest questions that need to be, need to be cracked for, for getting, getting us forward? Maybe starting Sonia. Well, I think they are the open APIs, open interfaces, and cooperation already in the early stage when we actually designed on the rules of the market because that's how, how can we can make it globally seamless to talk about the need for standardization or regulation on different topics to make it seamless and interoperable. Short news. Um, I I think uh, there, are, there are a lot of different services emerging, um, a lot of data out there. Um, I think probably the biggest challenge is, is actually in working out how we can bring those together and, and get the most value out of those um, for all the different uh, people who have an interest. Um, I think uh, for me, if I need to dream right now and close my eyes, I would love to say that I would love to see a I would love all users in the world to have a clear picture on how we can all work together and how we can bring M benefits to everyone. That would be, for me, the key thing. For me, I think the future of transportation, it's going to be essentially about software, data, and service, not hardware anymore. So I think the tough question is like, how are we adapting to that space, where it's about how you serve the, cast, the, the consumer, and not how you manufacture the product. And for me, I, I think it's touching on the points around regulation. How do you provide a regulatory framework that um, ensures public safety and things like that, but still leaves plenty of space for private companies to innovate? Because we've seen today some of the, some of the benefits that, that come from that. And how do you develop regulations when you don't know what the technology of tomorrow will look like? So how do you make them future looking and focused on regulating the outcome rather than how we get there? Thank you all, a great deal. I hope you all got as much as I did from this. And I hope to see many of you making startups and starting new business. And I hope that we were able to convince you that transportation is an interesting market to be in. Thank you all. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you.